This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. You know, because of the cross and the blood of Jesus that was shed on that cross, my life has been so impacted because of what the blood has accomplished. You know, the Bible says we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony about what the blood has accomplished. Because of the blood of Jesus, I don't have to work to be righteous. I have been made righteous. I have been, been made uh, uh, holy. I, I've been redeemed. I, I have the wisdom of God. And not because of my own performance, not because of my I mean, you'll never be any more righteous than what you are right now. And so the rest of it is the process of seeing who you already are being manifested as fruit so that others will be able to see it as well. But make, make no doubt about it. You are the righteousness of God because of what Jesus did on that cross. So celebrate. Celebrate the cross. Celebrate his blood and with his stripes, ladies and gentlemen. Ye were healed. God bless you and happy Easter. I'm a world changer. This is Changing Your World with Creflo Dollar. Now from the World Dome in College Park, Georgia, here's Pastor Dollar with today's message. What are the requirements of faith after Jesus went to the cross versus the requirements of faith before Jesus went to the cross? Now, um, did you notice that before the cross, none of the disciples were born again? Nobody was born again to Jesus after Jesus went to the cross, right? So let me ask you a question, make sure you understand what I said. Was anybody born again before Jesus shed his blood on the cross? No. So all those people you read about where Jesus went in cities and he healed them all, none of them were saved. Every story you read about in the gospel where Jesus went and laid hands on folks and they got healed, none of them were saved. All the miracles that happened to them happened to people that were not even born again. None of them were saved. And here are the disciples now. The disciples now are walking with Jesus. They, they were not saved. They, they couldn't have been saved because you didn't get born again. It wasn't available until Jesus went to the cross. Now, I started noticing Jesus kept making this commentary about the disciples. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Now, I never paid too much attention to that because I just thought, well, you know, they, they didn't have enough faith. That's why it didn't work for them. But he kept saying, oh, ye of little faith. And I'm thinking, there is something about why he kept saying that. So, I want to look at the book of Matthew. I kind of want to take you through the thinking process of what, what I saw here. And I want to show you, because all of us have been taught, all of us have been trained that you got to have faith first in order to get the results. Yes. So anytime something going on in your life, it's now, it, here, here's, here's the, your thinking process. I got I to gotta, I gotta get my faith out there. Then it'll come. Isn't that the truth? Well, isn't that the pattern of the old? That's the pattern of the old. If that's the pattern of the old, isn't that now, that old system now invalid? So you have to ask your question, if he doesn't require for me to walk in faith first in order for it to happen, then what is now the requirement after the cross where my faith is concerned? Because if that's the issue, that means everybody in here, including your pastor, has been operating by the requirements of the old covenant. I got to get my faith out, then I can get healed. 
I got to get my faith out, and then I can get delivered. I got to get my faith out, and, and, and then, then I'll prosper. I got to get my faith out, and then I'll get my, 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 my promotion. Oh, yeah, I, I think I got your attention. Huh? But isn't that what I do first, enabling God to do second? All right, now, so let's go through, let's just use Matthew. It's all in other four Gospels. Let's just use this one book, Matthew, and let's look at Matthew 6 and 30, and let's go through it, and let's examine every time he said, oh, ye of little faith, oh, ye of little faith. Because after the cross, I, Paul never said anything about a believer having little faith. Matthew 6, verse 30. Are you ready? We are, we are about to, we are going to be the bold. We're going to be the army of God in these last days, and God is going to be able to use us to produce infallible proofs. See, that's the only way you're going to start a revival back in this country. Somebody got to be a show-and-tell person. You got to, somebody got to say, watch this. It's time to lay hands in the name of Jesus. It's time to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. It's time to walk on water in the name of Jesus. It's time to let this world know that our God is not dead. He is alive. All right, now, are we ready? All right, let's go into a period of focus and concentration. You pray for me that I can be calm. I pray for you that you can be calm. And then when we get it, we, we just let it rip. All right. Oh, Jesus, help me. Lord, have mercy. All right. <clears throat> Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, it, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, the situation here is they were, they were around, they were worried about what they're going to drink. They were worried about what they're going to eat. They were worried about how, how they're going to be clothed. And there is Jesus right there. And Jesus said, you know, if, if God so clothed the grass of the field and if he took care of them, don't you think he'll clothe you? And it was almost like I got the picture of Jesus is saying, can you see me? Can you see me? Oh, ye of little faith. Go to chapter 14, verse 30. Now, this one all but just screamed it out to me. Well, let's, let's hold on to that one. Go to, go to Matthew 8, go to Matthew 8, 26. Matthew 8, 26. I'm going to do this a little different than we did last night. All right, now watch this. And he said unto them, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Why do you keep calling them, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Each time he called them, O ye of little faith, he was there. He was there. He is on the boat, and they are acting like he's not on the boat, and he is right there on the boat, sleeping, trying to get some Z's, and they wake him up. We're going to die. We're going to die. He said, oh, ye of little faith. Now, here's what I believe he was saying. Why are you so fearful? I'm on the boat. I'm on the boat. I'm on the boat, and you still ain't. How can you not have faith and I'm on the boat? Mm. Mm. I know some of y'all just, oh, uh -huh, come bring it on now. Matthew 16 and 8. Matthew 16 and 8. Lord, you got to help me this morning. Verse 8. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourself because you have brought no bread? I know there are the multitudes here. I know everybody needs to be fed. I know ain't no grocery stores around nowhere. I know 200 penny worth is not, a work, is not enough that they all may eat. I'm here. Why y'all, why you talking about you ain't got no bread to feed nobody? I'm here. It's just like Mary and Martha. If you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. 
Oh, ye of little faith, do you know who you're talking to? I'm here. I am the resurrection and the life. All right, now watch this. Look at uh, Matthew 14 and 30. It is, it, it is so clear. Look at what he's getting ready to say. Matthew 14, verse 30. All right, now watch this. So now here's the story. Oh, Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, brought him, caught him, and said unto him, look what he said, O thou a little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? And now, this is the story you're familiar with. There's Jesus out on the water, walking on the water. So the disciples thought it was a ghost. It was a phantom, a ghost. That's that word translated phantom. They saw Jesus walking on the water, and they thought it was a ghost. And, and the disciples said, here's what they asked. Peter asked this, if it be thou, if it be thou, then bid me to come. Now, he put Jesus' back against the corner because what was Jesus supposed to say? It be not, it be not me. <laughs> it was him, so he, G, the only thing Jesus could say was, come, because it be me. Right. And now watch this. Now watch this. Oh, glory. So he gets out of the boat a man just like you and me and he starts walking on the water. Now, what is the only thing in this equation that's different in, than any other time? There was Jesus. Jesus was walking on the water, and he said, come. And he got out the boat, and his eyes, his focus is on Jesus. He is focused on Jesus. Now, being focused on Jesus seems to produce the faith he needs to do something that men can't do when they don't see Jesus. But as long as he could see Jesus, faith was being released. Now, you need to understand something. Somebody said, yeah, but he fell. Oh, hold on a minute. Before he fell, he was walking on water. Before he fell, he was defying the law of gravity. I'm telling you, that's not an easy thing to do. I tried it. <laughs> there was a man, a flesh and blood man, walking on the water. How can a flesh and blood man walk on the water? He can't. But when Jesus is his focus, when a flesh and blood man can see Jesus, he can do things that are impossible. Oh, I apologize, but I got to go here. I don't know what you might be doing in your life, but if you can see Jesus, you can pay that bill. If you can see Jesus, you can get healed. If you can see Jesus, your children will get straight. If you can see Jesus, your marriage will get, everything will work when you can see Jesus. The problem is we try not to produce faith without seeing Jesus. So I got to see Jesus first. Now watch this. So I'm looking at Jesus. Faith, the fruit of faith is being released because I'm looking at Jesus. The fruit of faith is being released because I'm looking at Jesus. The fruit of faith is being released because I'm looking at Jesus. And right, now watch this. The devil said, man, I got to stop this before anybody else see it. I got to stop this before men think they can fly. <laughs> so guess what he did? He couldn't do nothing to Jesus. He just had to do something to get your attention away from the source of your faith. So he started messing with the wind, and the wind started moving, and the waves started moving, and guess what happened? He took his eye off the source of his faith, looked at the wind, and he began to sink. 
Now, what, what happens when you begin to sink? Watch this now, because here's proof. Here's proof right here that he's the source of my faith. As he began to sink, he looked back at Jesus and said, help. Come on, you got to know when you begin to sink in life, you got to find Jesus. You got to understand when you begin to sink, you got to get your eyes on Jesus. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Got his eyes back on Jesus. Jesus put his hand out there. Honey, if you need a hand, if you need the hand of the Lord, find him. Find him. Look at him. Put his hands out there. Watch this. Picked him up. Now, watch this. His focus is all on Jesus now, right? I mean, I can see him walking back to, I can see him walking with Jesus. Now, listen, he picks him up from sinking, and now both of them are walking on the water. See, God's trying to tell us something. They're both walking on the water. I'm telling you, you can't walk on your water without Jesus. You can't walk on top of your hard times without Jesus. You can't handle certain situations without Jesus. Jesus had to teach Peter that day, this is not you doing it by yourself with your manufactured faith. I am the source of your faith, and if you can look at me, turn to your neighbor and say, look at Jesus. I think you got it. You don't need to know nothing else from Matthew. You see what's going on. As if he was saying the whole time, oh, ye of little faith, you see me? Oh, ye of little faith, hey, 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 see me? Oh, ye of little faith, hey, hey, oh, ye of little faith, here I am. Oh, ye of little faith. Uh -huh. Now, look at uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Now, look at this. Oh, praise you, Jesus. And my sick yeah, yeah. Then my super yeah, yeah, I say it. A lot of you, if you're not have I have their kicker, if you've not already start going through it, get prepared for for for, for stupid trouble. <laughs> stupid trouble. Stuff stuff to you like, what? 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 That's a temptation to get your eyes off Jesus. Look at it, in the midst of it, find Jesus. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Look what he said now when all that stuff's going on. Looking unto Jesus, who is the what? The author and what? The finisher of what? Who's the author of your faith? Jesus. Who's the finisher of your faith? Jesus. Who's the source of your faith? Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before us, him endured the cross, despising the shame. And it is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3. For consider him. He says, in the midst of all of the stupid trouble, look at him. Consider him. Look at him. Consider him. What you consider the most is what will happen to you. The enemy knows that. But if you'll consider Jesus more than you consider the stupid trouble, then Jesus will make sure you're supplied with the fruit of faith to do what needs to be done. Yes. While grace has made everything available to you, Jesus is going to help you with the fruit of faith to get a hold of what grace has already made available to you. Consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied, watch this, and faint in your mind. That's the objective of the enemy. I want to get you weary, and I want you to faint in your mind. I want you to get weary because you can't figure out how this ain't happening. And you're trying to figure out why that had to happen to me and where that come from. And I thought I was doing that, and I thought I was doing Now, get your eyes on Jesus, because if you get your eyes on Jesus, the first thing you're going to realize is he was Jesus, and he was whipped with a cat of nine tails. He was Jesus, and he was punched and beat up and spit on. He was Jesus, and they nailed him to the cross. He was Jesus, and he died and went to hell. He was Jesus. Watch this. He rose on the third day. He is Jesus. He was seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And remember what the Bible says, that now that we are in him, we died with him, we rose with him, we are seated with him. Glory be to God. Look at Jesus. 
and ask and say to yourself, he went through all of that, so can I. Oh, my God. You look at what Jesus went through. There is nothing that we go through that can compare to what he went through. And if you keep your eye on him, he will be the source of the faith you need. It's what he did first that will e equip you and cause you to be able to be enabled to have the fruit of faith, the faith. You can walk by faith and not by sight when you get your eyes on him. You hear me? Look at Galatians 3, 23, 25. Now, this, this is it. This, 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 this just, bam, this just hits it. Galatians 3, 23 and 25. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. It's time to use the name of Jesus. That's the authority you have. When sickness comes in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. When somebody in your family gets sick, in the name of Jesus, I lay hand on you. I command you to be healed. When somebody's demon-possessed, in the name of Jesus, devil, I cast you out now. That shocks some of you, demon-possessed. What's that? Uh, every time, when you start acting funny sometimes, look in the mirror, you'll catch it. <laughs> it's time to use the name of Jesus. Now, watch this very carefully now. Focus. But before faith came, so that's why I kept calling them, oh, ye of little faith, oh, ye of little faith, because faith had not yet come. Oh, yeah, caution me. Lord, Lord, well, yeah, hold on. Let me, let me fix that. The Lord said, it had not come after the cross, but it came to those 12. Faith came to them. Now, watch this. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. So before faith came, what happened? They were under what? The law. And now look at verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, which is what? The law. Can you see? <laughs> that before Jesus came, they were under the law? And after Jesus came, they were no longer under the schoolmaster? Can you clearly see that faith is a person? Faith is a person? Say that. Faith is a person. What's that person's name? Jesus. Say this, faith is Jesus. Faith is Jesus. Or Jesus is faith. Jesus is faith. Somebody says, what? Well, Jesus is grace. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. He is faith and grace. Ephesians 2 and 8. That's a good, that's a good thing. He is faith and grace. Look at what happened in, in, look what happened here. See, when faith came, Jesus came. When Jesus came, faith came. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Jesus, full of grace and truth. Now I'm saying that Jesus is not only grace, he's also the source of your faith. Watch carefully now. John 15 says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. You are the branches. Ladies and gentlemen, can an apple tree produce the fruit of apples without being attached to the vine? It's impossible, right? Because the branch does not have in it the wherewithal that it can produce fruit by itself. He said, neither can you, except you be attached to me. So Jesus, oh my God. Yeah, that, yeah, that's good. Question. Who lives in you? Jesus. Who lives in you? 
Christ We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, and Christ is in me. So the root and tree called Christ is in you, right? If you will understand that the fruit of the Spirit cannot get on the branches without Christ, then you'll get yourself out of first place. I'm going to have to operate in faith first before I can get healed. Uh-uh. Jesus has already come into me, therefore I can operate in faith and get healed. Jesus lives on the inside of me. The vine and, and the root system is already in me, therefore I have enough faith to get delivered. You see what happens? You're trying to produce faith first faith manufactured out of your own strength instead of you understanding that it takes Christ the tree first in order for you to produce the fruit called faith. Many Christians today are living their lives as if Jesus had never gone to the cross. It's time for an update. Here is a key to knowing if you're operating in the old covenant before the cross or operating in the new covenant after the cross. If it's what you do first in order for God to do, you are operating in an invalid covenant. In the power of resurrection combo, Creflo Dollar reveals the key to getting God's best in our lives is to understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. After the cross, the order changed. It's no longer what you do first that enables God to do, but it is what Jesus does first that enables you to do. The Power of Resurrection Combo includes the Life After the Cross four-message series, along with the two-message series, Transformed by the Resurrected Jesus, and the Life After the Cross Grace Curriculum mini book, all for the love gift of $25 or more. Or for any gift amount, you will receive the Transformed by the Resurrected Jesus series. Call or go online to order today. I wish I had more time on the air so I could share with you some of the thousands of testimonies we receive every year. You know, last year alone, Creflo Dollar Global Missions fed, clothed, housed, and shared the gospel of grace with people, not only in the United States, but on practically every continent in the world. You equip us to fulfill Jesus' mandate to preach the gospel in the uttermost parts of the world. For more information on the work Creflo Dollar Global Missions is doing around the world, please visit our website. Your generosity allows us to make a difference in the lives of people all over the world. Through Creflo Dollar Global Missions, we are providing food, clothing, crucial supplies, and the Word of God to people in the most remote regions of the world. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe.